Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So, Sheikh Sa'ad, uh, we were together in Malaysia two days ago, alhamdulillah, and now we're here, alhamdulillah, back in Baltimore. I'm not going to say which one's nicer, but alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, and, and he was just asking me if he took some of my topic, and he, and he did take a lot of my topic, actually. But um, at the same time, I think in this whole concept of fairness, and it's, it's good because I actually have a lecture tonight, inshallah ta'ala, about why does God uh, do certain things. And so I don't have to address that part of the, the lecture right now, inshallah, or the topic right now. But I think if we address it purely from a seerah perspective, meaning studying the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then we learn a lot about the concept of fairness and how fairness was viewed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and by the companions around him. Number one, is fairness objective or subjective? Is it an objective term and is, or is it a subjective term? For those of you that don't know what that means, would everyone in here be able to agree on what fairness is? Would we be able to agree on that? In fact, no two people would be able to come together and agree upon a fair salary for everyone in the world and what would be fair for every person in the world. It's an extremely subjective term, which makes it a very difficult subject to address. And what we realize when we study this topic of fairness as a whole is that not only is it, is it subjective, but it really is a mindset. It's completely a mindset. And for many people, it's a mindset of entitlement, meaning what? Life's not fair because I didn't get this and I didn't get that and because this didn't happen for me and that didn't happen for me. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times it says, it says a lot about our priorities in life and what we think about because a lot of times you don't have your faith crisis, you don't start thinking about life not being fair because of the children that are starving in Africa or in Syria or whatever it may be. You start thinking that life's not fair when you didn't get into med school or when you didn't marry the person that you wanted to marry. Right? That's when you start questioning God, and that's when you start questioning the fairness of life. That's a greater crisis to you than the other stuff that was going on in the world. And you started using the other stuff in the world because now you're depressed and now life wasn't fair to you. And you're complaining, and while you're complaining, you get to a point sometimes where you accuse God himself, Allah himself, of being unfair, which is the discussion tonight that I'm not going to touch. But it shows you that it's a concept, or it is a mindset of entitlement. And you know, subhanAllah, when you study it, truly from, you know, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said something very powerful. Um, he said that the people that accuse Allah of not having adil, of not being just, and of life not being just to them, it's not that they want, li it's not that they want life to be fair, it's that they want life to be unfair in their favor. I thought that was very powerful, subhanAllah, when I read that. He said, you know, you know and think about that. It's, you, you don't really need text to justify that statement. You know, you want to be rich. You're not really complaining about life being unfair when things are going well for you. Okay, when you have your house, when you have your car, when you have your career, when you have your education, when you have your money, it doesn't matter that life's unfair. You can very, you can very easily quote the ayat of the Qur'an about patience and those types of things and say, yeah, you know, Allah's taking care of them and there's a greater purpose for them. Alhamdulillah, we should all say alhamdulillah and we should all be happy. It's not, there, it's not a problem when it's unfair in your favor. It's a problem when you feel like you're getting the bad end of it. And you know, again, it's so subjective that I'll share with you all a personal experience. I had someone in my office, in my masjid, uh, three years ago. And I try not to give many details because thanks to YouTube, I've gotten in a lot of trouble over the last few years uh, of telling stories without saying names. And then that person watches them on YouTube and I get in trouble. So I'll try not to be uh, too detailed in what I say. But one of the things that, that, you know, that, that took place, subhanAllah, over six years of being imam in New Orleans is that I was, exposed, or I was exposed to the real problems that we have as a community and also how shallow and superficial we are as people. And you know, so I had this brother in my office and, and he's crying. And I was wondering why he's, you know, I thought something tragic happened in his life and, you know, he lost his job or something happened. But, you know, instead what he's talking about, he's saying that, you know, life's been tough recently. And he lives in a really nice house, mashallah, great car, very rich, very wealthy, has several kids. And he says, life's been tough recently, you know, and, you know, things are getting really tough. And he said, but I don't know, you know, sometimes I question Allah. And I said, oh, you know, a'udhu billah, what's going on? And he starts telling me, he says, you know, Every year, I take my kids to Europe for a vacation. And he said, this year I don't have enough money to take my kids to Europe for a summer vacation. What am I supposed to tell my kids when they come to me and tell me, Dad, why aren't we going anywhere this summer? 
That was his faith crisis. <laughs> to him, that was life being unfair. And I'm sitting there looking at him like, and what else happened? But to him, that's life being unfair. And what does that show you? Again, it is a mindset. There's a very powerful hadith. Very, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It's narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As anhu. If my memory does not fail me, I think it's from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ Verily, he has succeeded, who has submitted himself. Sheikh Sa'ad talked about the Islam part. Submitted himself. It's a prerequisite to everything that comes next in the hadith. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَرُزِقَ كَفَافًا and he was given enough. Kafaf means to be given just enough. And listen to the last part of the hadith. وَقَنَّعَهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا أَتَهُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala convinced him or satisfied him with what he gave him. So what does that show you? That these two, that these two things that were just mentioned don't always come together. You might be given enough, but you're not convinced with what you have and you're not satisfied with what you have. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who really succeeds in life and the one who's really happy in life is, is the one who has submitted himself, who has, who has attained that peace through Islam, was given enough, and Allah satisfied him with what he gave him. Allah convinced him. Qana'ah is, is literally to be convinced. It's not rida, it's not necessarily satisfaction or contentment. It's literally to look at yourself and say, Alhamdulillah, yeah, you know, this is good, this is great. And when you look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet, peace be upon him, went through many stages in his life. And that's why I say we can justify this through a seerah perspective. And Imam Al-Qurtubi in particular, rahimahullah, he says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was tested with every phase of life. He was tested with wealth, with ghina, he was rich. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was rich after he married Khadija radiallahu anha until the time that he received his revelation. He was a rich man. He became a wealthy man. And he passed the test of wealth. That's what he said. Wa ahsana fi ghina'i. He passed the test of al ghina. How did, how did he pass the test of al ghina? Because when he was rich, what did he do? He freed slaves. He took care of orphans. He didn't become arrogant as a result of his wealth. His personality did not change at all. Right? The Prophet, peace be upon him, did not change as a result of being wealthy. And, and in fact, those were the words that Khadija radiallahu anha shared with the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he came down from Hira, right? لا يخزيك الله أبدا Allah will never humiliate you. Why? Because look at all the great things that you do. You know, you do well by orphans and, and your guests and your neighbors and your family. You do well with people. You do what you're supposed to do. And Khadija has been rich longer than the Prophet, peace be upon him. She knows that most rich people are snobs. They don't do that stuff. He passed that test. Then Imam Al-Qurtubi said, Allah stripped him of everything and tested him with poverty, with Al-Faqr. Absolute poverty. The Prophet, peace be upon him, experienced poverty in its worst form. Not only did he experience poverty from a financial perspective, but you know, truly, as, as Sheikh Saad mentioned, everything was taken away from him. Everything was taken away from him. His wife, his uncle, his protection, everything. His support from his tribe, his land, his home. I mean, everything was taken away from him. And he said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed the test of poverty. Ahsana fi faqrihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He passed that test. Why? Because he showed a beautiful patience. He demonstrated truly, sabrun jameel, a beautiful patience. Not only was he patient because he had to be patient, he demonstrated a, a satisfaction with God, a contentment with God. And the only thing he cared about in those moments of poverty was God not being displeased with him, was that poverty not being a manifestation of Allah's displeasure. Because sometimes you question yourself in poverty. And that's a mistake in mindset. That's a mistake in the way we think sometimes. It's called the prosperity doctrine. Almost every religion in the world has some form of the prosperity doctrine. Okay? Whether it be the Eastern religions and Hinduism, the caste system, or even in evangelical Christianity today, that when God loves you or whatever divine presence loves you, you're well off. And when God doesn't love you, then you're not doing too well. But Islam preaches the exact opposite. Right? When Allah loves you, He tests you. When Allah loves you, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah withholds the water, withholds the world from you the way that one of you would withhold water from one who has a fever. 
Meaning what? Someone who's sick in, in that particular sickness, he thinks that, the, you know, or, or he wants that water. You know, uh, if you, you know, well, I want to say if you've seen a woman in delivery, right? Sisters, those of you that went through delivery, and brothers, those of you that saw women going through delivery and were terrified and thought that your wife would kill you, all right? Uh, at that moment, you know, whenever a woman really wants to drink water, and, you know, I remember being put in that situation. I don't want to go too far into detail, right? But my wife really, really wanted water, and the nurse said no. And my wife looked at me like, are you going to listen to the nurse? <laughs> like, this is a pretty awkward situation for me right now, right? She really wants that water at that moment. Really, you know, when you're, you're sick. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah withholds the dunya from you the way you would withhold water from, from your, from your saqeem, from your, from your person who's sick, who has that fever at that moment. Meaning what? It goes back into addictions. Don't expect Allah to feed your dunya addictions. And it's for your own good. Right? So the believer recognizes even in his poverty that when Allah withholds, He gives. He gives you something greater than what He withheld from you. And that's exactly what happened to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then he said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was put in a state of al-kafaf. Al-kafaf means to just have enough. Literally just enough to survive. And the Prophet ﷺ, his kafaf, his just enough to survive, would have been considered poverty by any one of us. What the Prophet lived through wasallam, would have been considered poverty for any one of us. He never had two meals a day. Wouldn't we consider that poverty? Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, we never had two meals a day. Except that one of them was dates and water. Meaning what? It wasn't really a meal. We just had a few dates and water. Months would pass without any smoke coming from the house of the Prophet ﷺ, Meaning he didn't have a cooked meal. He never enjoyed fine bread, a fine loaf of bread. That's poverty to us. The Prophet ﷺ's house, his hujr, you know, his hujrat, the, the, the apartments that the Prophet ﷺ lived in were so small that when he would make sujood, when he would prostrate, he would tap Aisha on the legs so that she could move her legs up so that he could have enough space to do his sajda, to prostrate. If any one of us saw that, we'd say that's poverty to him that was enough. And you know what's amazing is that the Prophet wasallam, he was satisfied with what he had. But you know what? Some of the companions thought, hey, that's not fair. And so Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he walks in the Prophet ﷺ's house and he sees the Prophet ﷺ getting up from his bed, and his bed is just some branches stuffed with leather, and, you know, and he sees the marks on the Prophet ﷺ's back, he starts to cry. And the Prophet ﷺ says, why are you crying? And what does Umar say? He says, I've seen the palaces of Kisra. I've seen the palaces of, of, of Kisra in Persia and of Caesar in Rome. I've seen what other kings live like. And you deserve better than that. What's Omar telling the Prophet ﷺ? This isn't fair. Right? You shouldn't live like this. Life's not fair to you. You shouldn't have to live like that. You're the greatest man in the world. You're the Prophet ﷺ. And all of us would agree that we would want him to live a better life in this world. Right? We would have wanted for him to have more ease. And it's, it's, it's really interesting because put yourself in the Prophet ﷺ's shoes at that moment. The Prophet ﷺ did not say to Umar, well, yeah, you guys should probably do something about that. <laughs> right? Now that you're upset about it, why don't you guys go build me a house or something? The Prophet ﷺ, he says to Umar, أَلَا تَرْضَى Aren't you satisfied? أَنَّ لَهُمُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَنَا الْآخِرَةَ That they have the dunya, they have this materialistic world, and we have the hereafter. With complete conviction. Look, the Prophet ﷺ is telling Umar, don't think life's been unfair to me. You're worried about me, I'm fine. I'm happy. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he used to ask for this. He didn't used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a lot. He used to say, Allah murzuq ala Muhammadin quta. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Oh Allah, give Muhammad ﷺ and his family just enough. He used to ask Allah for al-kafaf. You know, a lot of times when we talk about Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fil akhirati hasna wa qina adab, I'm going to burst your bubble. I, I, I have to. I have to burst your bubble because this, this ayah is used in, in, my, in my humble opinion sometimes in an inappropriate context. That ask Allah for the dunya, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fil akhirati hasna wa qina adab anna. Because Allah certainly did respond to those who don't ask for anything of this world. They just think that we only want in the hereafter. And our asceticism, our zuhd in this religion, is not one that requires a poverty or a torture on our part. So Allah taught us to ask for the good of this world and the good of the hereafter. 
and to protect us from the punishment of hellfire. But here's the thing, what is hasana in dunya? Is hasana in dunya an amazingly big house, an amazingly large house? Is hasana in dunya that, perf, you know, that, that attractive spouse, the one that you've always wanted? Is that what hasana in dunya is? No. Imam Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, Al-Hasana, fi dunya ilmun nafi'a wa rizqun tayyiba wa amala mutaqabbala. That goodness in this world is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us to ask for every morning and every evening. Ilman nafi'a, beneficial knowledge. This is of this dunya, right? This is good. This is good for you in this world as well. Beneficial knowledge. Wa rizqan tayyiba. Not rizqan kathira. Pure halal sustenance. That's good, that's satisfying, that has blessing within it, that sustains us, that takes care of us, that doesn't involve anything prohibited. وَعَمَلًا متقبلة, And accepted deeds. So two of the things, of, two of the three things that even fall within one third of the equation of what you're asking Allah for are still akhirah based. They're still based on the hereafter. Right? So asking Allah for enough, being in a state of kafaf, being in a state where you're satisfied, Having that mindset, قَنَّعَهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا أَتَى Allah has given you enough and He satisfied you with it. So that you're not constantly looking around. And if there was anyone that could claim that he didn't have a fair share in life, it was the Prophet I mean, he buried six of seven children. Wallahi, I can't even imagine the pain of burying one of my children. May Allah protect us and protect our families. Allahumma, I mean, I can't fathom that pain. I can fathom a lot of pain. I can't fathom that pain. I really can't. And I can't fathom the Prophet ﷺ having to go to six of, of his seven children's janazas and to bury them himself. That's painful. That's self... I mean, anyone else would have lost their sanity. Right? I mean, after the second child, you know, you might lose your sanity. Some people after the first. That's, that's harsh. But he didn't claim that life wasn't fair to him. And he didn't want his companions to see life as being unfair to him. Rather, he shifted the mindset. He shifted the priorities of the companions. And so what's interesting is that even the companions that complained about life being unfair, they didn't complain about life being unfair in the dunya we sense. They complained about life being unfair in the akhirah sense. What am I talking about? When the poor companions came to the Prophet them to complain about the rich companions, they didn't say to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's not fair. We pray like they pray, or they pray like we pray. They fast like we fast, we do everything they do, but they get to live in these nice houses. What were they complaining about? They get all the good deeds. Why? Because they have money to give charity with. <laughs> it's amazing. Like they, it didn't occur to them. Ahl al-Sufa, you don't see a single time the people that lived in the back of the masjid that really were poor. You don't see them coming to the Prophet ﷺ and saying, Hey, I'm Abu Huraira. Right? As, good, as great of a companion as I am, you know, how come they get to live like that and I have to live like this? Even Rabia ibn Ka'b al-Aslami, who the Prophet ﷺ told him, ask me, you have a blank check. Can you imagine if the Prophet ﷺ was in front of you? And no, the Prophet ﷺ is not a fictional blue genie. He's the Prophet of Allah. And he says, sell me, ask me anything. And Rabia is a young, unmarried, homeless man. Think about that. And he says, Murafaqatak, your companionship in paradise. <laughs> that's all. The Prophet ﷺ says anything else. Right? Like that's a given. You know, you're you're my companion. You know, I, I love you. Clearly, I love you. We already know it's an established concept in our religion. You are with the one that you love. You'll be okay with that in that sense. Anything else? You know, you're sure you don't want me to throw in a wife there? <laughs> right? Or a house? Anything else? Rabi'ah said, that's it. That's all I want. So the poor companions, when they came to the Prophet ﷺ and complained about the rich companions, they weren't complaining about their worldly situation. They were, they were upset because they thought they have more money than us, which they did. And they give more because they have more to give. So then the Prophet ﷺ told them what? You know, let me teach you something that you can give sadaqah with as well. Say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. The, the, the remembrances that we do after the prayer. So the poor companions got excited, they had something, then they came back to the Prophet ﷺ and they complained again. Why? Because the rich companions found out about that <laughs> and they were doing that too now and they still had the sadaqah, they still had the leverage of charity, of giving charity. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ said, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءِ 
that is the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He gives it to whom He wills. Meaning what? Look, if they're that rich and that's what they're still motivated towards, they are the exception. They are not the norm. Because you know what? The majority of the people of paradise are who? Poor people. It's a fact. The Prophet said, no, richness, wealth is not discouraged in our religion. It's not. They're rich companions. Abu Bakr anhu was a rich man. You know, the greatest of the companions. But the Prophet said, the majority of the people of paradise are poor people. Why? Because most people, when they get wealthy, they become arrogant and prideful as a result of that. And that's why wealth is a greater test than poverty. Wealth is a greater test than poverty because we understand things in the absolute sense. Our understanding of fairness and justice is not limited to whatever years we have on earth. Wealth is a greater test than poverty. And on the Day of Judgment, it is a greater test than poverty. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the, even the rich that get into Jannah, they would enter Jannah, and this is also in the Sahih, that they would enter into paradise 500 years after the poor. Min kathrat al-su'al. Because they have to answer more questions. They have more to, to, to be held accountable for. So the, the fact of the matter is that nablukum bil sharri wal khayri, bil khayri wal shar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you with, with ease and with hardship, fitna. And that's a means of trial for you. So yes, life might not appear to be fair, but Allah is fair. Allah is fair. Life might not be fair, God is always fair. And that's why Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden you more than what you can handle. Allah doesn't give you more than what you can handle. Allah doesn't burden a soul beyond its scope. The Prophet ﷺ could handle six out of seven children in Janazah. We can't. We can't. Okay? Allah tests you according to your circumstances and He burdens you only according to your scope. And let's face it, there are people in this world that have overcome enormous challenges of poverty, of medical challenges, right? Of, of, of economic challenges. People that have overcome enormous challenges to do amazing things in this world because they didn't wait for life to be fair. Right? And that's just the, that's the, the, the harsh reality is that life will not wait for you to adjust your mindset. Okay, for you to have a boost of self-esteem. It's going to come at you when it comes at you. You have to be ready for it. And you have to adjust your mindset. And the more time you waste talking about, well, my parents were like this, and my environment's like this, and in this country we have this, and you know, I didn't financially have this or that, then you're going to be in trouble. And I'll leave you guys with a story. It's, this is a very interesting story because I was reading it, subhanAllah. Actually, I was just reading it yesterday. I wasn't planning to share it in my talk, but I think it's relevant. I was reading a, a biography of an Imam Ibn Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Hazm was a very rich scholar. Ibn Hazm, a scholar of Andalus, was a very rich man. And he used to get into a lot of debates. That's one of his flaws as, as, as a man, was that he got into a lot of debates and sometimes became pretty rough in his debates. But we take the good, obviously as Muslims, when we study the biographies of the people of the past, we take their good and we overlook their flaws because of the enormous good that they put forth. So Ibn Hazm used to engage in a lot of debates. So in one of these debates, he was debating a scholar from a more humble background. And Ibn Hazm won the debate. Right? Because Ibn Hazm was able to recall a text that the other man was not able to recall. So the other man throws a cheap shot at Ibn Hazm. Here's what he says. And I'm trying to translate instant translation in my head. But he said to Ibn Hazm that perhaps I didn't see that because the oil from my candle ran out. You guys see it? What he's saying to him? He's like, look, I don't have the lights that you have in your house, mashallah. I only had this candle that I was reading and I was studying for the debate for. So maybe the oil ran out and that's why I, 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 I overlooked that text that you were able to recall and win the debate with. And Ibn Hazm, he said, yeah, and I had a difficult time seeing it as well under the golden chandeliers in my house. <laughs> what was he saying to him? He was saying that just as you are distracted by your poverty, and he didn't literally have golden chandeliers, he said that wealth is usually a distraction for people from knowledge. So your candle is a distraction, my chandelier is a distraction as well. No excuses. So he won the debate again. 
So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be amongst those that are satisfied with what has been given to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us pleased with him, both in the legislation that he's given to us in religion and in the legislation of events that will take place in our lives. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those that are ultimate, ultimately pleased with Jannah, with paradise. Allahumma ameen. I'll cover the other side of this topic, which is whether or not God is fair then. Inshallah ta'ala tonight uh, in the discussion, which I think is really late night. So if you guys are awake, then inshallah ta'ala see you then. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.